Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari While Raffaello dal Colle of Borgo San Sepulcro, who was a disciple of Giulio Romano, and helped him to paint in fresco the Hall of Constantine in the Papal Palace at Rome, and the apartments of the Te in Mantua was painting, after his return to the Borgo, the altarpiece of the chapel of Saints Giulio e Arcanio, in which, imitating Giulio and Raffaello da Urbino, he depicted the resurrection of Christ, a work that was much extolled, with another altarpiece of the Assumption for the Frati de Zoccoli, without the Borgo, and some other works for the Servite friars at Citta di Castello. While, I say, Raffaello was executing these and other works in the Borgo, his native place acquiring riches and fame, a young man, sixteen years of age, called Cristofano, and by way of by name, Docino, the son of Guido Gerardi, a man of honorable family in that city, was attending from a natural inclination and with much profit to painting, drawing, and coloring so well and with such grace that it was a marvel. Wherefore, the above-named Raffaello, having seen some animals by the hand of this Cristofano, such as dogs, wolves, hares, and various kinds of birds and fishes, executed very well, and, perceiving that he was most agreeable in his conversation, and very witty and amusing, although he lived a life apart, almost like a philosopher, was well pleased to form a friendship with him, and to have him frequent his workshop in order to learn. Now, after Cristofano had spent some time drawing under the discipline of Raffaello, there arrived in the Borgo the painter Rosso, with whom he contracted a friendship, and received some of his drawings, and these Docino studied with great diligence, considering, as one who had seen no others but those by the hand of Raffaello, that they were very beautiful, as indeed they were. But these studies were broken off by him, for when Giovanni di Torini of the Borgo, at that time captain of the Florentines, went with a band of soldiers from the Borgo and from Citta di Castello to the defense of Florence, which was besieged by the armies of the emperor and of Pope Clement, Cristofano went thither among the other soldiers, having been led away by his many friends. It is true that he did this no less in the hope of having some occasion to study the works in Florence than with the intention of fighting, but in this he failed, for his captain, Giovanni, had to guard not a place within the city, but the bastions on the hill without. That war finished, and the guard of Florence being commanded not long afterwards by Signor Alessandro Vitelli of Citta di Castello, Cristofano, drawn by his friends, and by his desire to see the pictures and sculptures of the city, enlisted as a soldier in that guard. And while he was in that service, Signor Alessandro, having heard from Battista della Biglia, a painter and soldier from Citta di Castello, that Cristofano gave his attention to painting, and having obtained a beautiful picture by his hand, determined to send him with that same Battista della Biglia, and with another Battista, likewise of Cita di Castello, to decorate with scraffiti and paintings a garden and loggia that he had begun at Cita di Castello. But the one Battista having died while that garden was being built up, and the other Battista having taken his place. For the time being, whatever may have been the reason, nothing more was done. Meanwhile, Giorgio Vasari had returned from Rome, and was passing his time with Duke Alessandro in Florence, until his patron, Cardinal Ippolito, should return from Hungary, and he had received rooms in the convent of the Servites, that he might make a beginning with the execution of certain scenes in fresco from the life of Caesar in the chamber at the corner of the Medici Palace, where Giovanni da Udini had decorated the ceiling with stucco work and pictures. 
Now, Cristofano, having made Giorgio's acquaintance at the Borgo in the year 1528, when he went to see Rosso in that place, where he had shown him much kindness, resolved that he would attach himself to Vasari, and thus find much more opportunity for giving attention to art than he had done in the past. Giorgio then, after a year's intercourse with him as his companion, finding that he was likely to make an able master, and that he was pleasant and gentle in manners, and a man after his own heart, conceived an extraordinary affection for him. Wherefore, having to go not long afterwards, at the commission of Duke Alessandro, to Citta de Castello, in company with Antonio de Sangallo and Pier Francesco de Viterbo, who had been in Florence to build the castle, or rather citadel, and on their return were taking the road by Citta de Castello, in order to repair the walls of the above-mentioned garden of Vitelli, which were threatening to fall, he took Cristofano with him to the end that after Vasari himself had designed and distributed in their due order the friezes which were to be executed in certain apartments, and likewise the scenes and compartments of a bathroom, and other sketches for the walls of the loggia, Girardi and the above-named Battista might carry the whole to completion. All this they did so well and with such grace, and particularly Cristofano, that a past master in art, well practiced in his work, could not have done so much, and, what is more, experimenting in that work, he became facile and able to a marvel in drawing and coloring. Then, in the year 1536, the Emperor Charles V, coming to Italy and to Florence, as has been related in other places, the most magnificent festive preparations were ordained, among which Vasari, by orders of Duke Alessandro, received the charge of the decorations of the Porta a San Piero Gattolini, of the façade at San Felice in Piazza, at the head of the Via Maggio, and of the pediment that was erected over the door of Santa Maria del Fiore and in addition of a standard of cloth for the castle, fifteen braccia in depth and forty in length, into the gilding of which there went fifty thousand leaves of gold. Now the Florentine painters and others who were employed in these preparations, thinking that Vasari was too much in favor with Duke Alessandro, and wishing to leave him disgraced in that part of the decorations, a part truly great and laborious which had fallen to him, so went to work that he was not able to enlist the services of any master of architectural painting, whether young or old, among all those that were in the city, to assist him in any single thing. Of which, having become aware, Vasari sent for Cristofano, Raffaello del Colli, and Stefano Veltroni of Monte Sansovino, his kinsman, and with their assistance and that of other painters from Arezzo and other places, he executed the works mentioned above, in which Cristofano acquitted himself in such a manner that he caused every one to marvel, doing honor to himself and also to Vasari, who was much extolled for those works. After they were finished, Cristofano remained many days in Florence, assisting the same Vasari in the preparations that were made in the palace of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici for the nuptials of Duke Alessandro, wherein, among other things, Cristofano executed the coat of arms of the Duchess Margarita of Austria with the balls upheld by a most beautiful eagle, with some boys very well done. Not long afterwards, when Duke Alessandro had been assassinated, a compact was made in the Borgo to hand over one of the gates of the city to Piero Strazzi when he came to Sestino, and letters were therefore written to Cristofano by some soldiers exiled from the Borgo entreating him that he should consent to help them in this, 
which letters received, although Cristofano did not grant their request, yet, in order not to do a mischief to the soldiers, he chose rather to tear them up as he did, than to lay them, as according to the laws and edicts he should have done, before Gerardo Girardi, who was then commissioner for the Lord Duke Cosimo in the Borgo. When the troubles were over and the matter became known, many citizens of the Borgo were exiled as rebels, and among them Dosino, and Signor Alessandro Vitelli, who knew the truth of this affair and could have helped him, did not do so, to the end that Cristofano might be, as it were, forced to serve him in the work of his garden at Cita di Castello, of which we have spoken above. After having consumed much time in this service without any profit or advantage, Cristofano finally took refuge, almost in despair with other exiles, in the village of San Gustino in the States of the Church, a mile and a half distant from the Borgo and very near the Florentine frontier. In that place, although he stayed there at his peril, he painted for Abbot Bufolini of Cita di Castello, who has most beautiful and commodious apartments there, a chamber in a tower, with a pattern of little boys and figures, very well foreshortened, to be seen from below, and with grotesques, festoons, and masks, the most lovely and the most bizarre that could be imagined. This chamber, when finished, so pleased the abbot that he caused him to do another, in which, desiring to make some ornaments of stucco, and not having marble to grind into powder for mixing it, for this purpose he found a very good substitute in some stones from a river bed, veined with white, the powder from which took a good and very firm hold and within these ornaments of stucco Cristofano then painted some scenes from Roman history, executing them so well in fresco that it was a marvel. At that time, Giorgio Vasari was painting in fresco the upper part of the tramezzo of the Abbey of Camaldoli, and two panel pictures for the lower part and wishing to make about these last an ornament in fresco full of scenes, he would have liked to have Cristofano with him, no less to restore him to the favor of the duke than to make use of him. But although Messer Ottaviano de' Medici pleaded strongly with the duke, it proved impossible to bend him, so ugly was the information that had been given to him about the behavior of Cristofano. Not having succeeded in this, therefore, Vasari, as one who loved Cristofano, set himself to contrive to remove him at least from San Gustino, where he, with other exiles, was living in the greatest peril. In the year 1539, then, having to execute for the monks of Monte Oliveto, for the head of a great refectory in the monastery of San Michel, in Bosco without Bologna, three panel pictures in oils with three scenes, each four braccia in length, and a frieze in fresco three braccia high, all round, with twenty stories of the apocalypse in little figures, and all the monasteries of that order copied from the reality, with partitions of grotesques, and round each window fourteen braccia of festoons with fruits copied from nature. Giorgio wrote straightway to Cristofano that he should go from San Gustino to Bologna, together with Battista Cungi of the Borgo, his compatriot, who had also served Vasari for seven years. These men, therefore, having gone to Bologna, where Giorgio had not yet arrived, for he was still at Camaldoli, where, having finished the tramezzo, he was drawing the cartoon for a deposition from the cross, which was afterwards executed by him, and set up on the high altar in that same place, set themselves to prime the said three panels with gesso, and to lay on the ground until such time as Giorgio should arrive. 
Now Vasari had given a commission to the Tero, a Jew, the friend of Messer Ottaviano de' Medici, who was then a banker in Bologna, that he should provide Cristofano and Battista with everything that they required. And since this Detero was very obliging and most courteous, he did them a thousand favors and courtesies. Wherefore, those two at times went about Bologna in his company in very familiar fashion, and Battista having prominent eyes, and Cristofano a great speck in one of his, they were thus taken for Jews, as Detero was in fact. One morning, therefore, a shoemaker, who had to bring a pair of new shoes at the commission of the above-named Jew to Cristofano, arriving at the monastery, said to Cristofano himself, who was standing at the gate looking on at the distribution of alms, Sir, could you show me the rooms of those two Jew painters who are working in there? Jews or no Jews, said Cristofano, what have you to do with them? I have to give these shoes, he answered, to one of them called Cristofano. I am he, replied Cristofano, an honest man and a better Christian than you are. You may be what you please, answered the shoemaker. I called you Jews because, besides that you are held and known as Jews by everyone, that look of yours, which is not of our country, convinced me of it. Enough, said Cristofano, you shall see that we do the work of Christians. But to return to the work, Vasari having arrived in Bologna, not a month had passed before, Giorgio designing, and Cristofano and Battista laying in the panels in color, all three were completely laid in, with great credit to Cristofano, who acquitted himself in this excellently well. The laying in of the panels being finished, work was begun on the frieze, in which Cristofano had a companion, although he was to have executed it all by himself, for there came from Camaldoli to Bologna the cousin of Vasari, Stefano Veltroni of Monte San Savino, who had laid in the panel picture of the deposition and the two executed that work together, and that so well that it proved a marvel. Cristofano painted grotesques so well that there was nothing better to be seen, but he did not give them that particular finish that would have made them perfect, and Stefano, on the contrary, was wanting in resolution and grace, for the reason that his brushstrokes did not fix his subjects in their places at one sweep, but since he was very patient in the end although he endured greater labor he used to execute his grotesques with more neatness and delicacy laboring in competition then at the work of this frieze these two took such pains both the one and the other that cristofano learned to finish from stefano and stefano learned from cristofano to be more resolute and to work like a master Work being then begun on the broad festoons that were to run in clusters round the windows, Vasari made one with his own hand, keeping real fruits in front of him, that he might copy them from nature. This done, he ordained that Cristofano and Stefano should go on with the rest, holding to the same design, one on one side of the window, and the other on the other side, and should thus, one by one, proceed to finish them all, promising to him who might prove at the end of the work to have acquitted himself best a pair of scarlet hose. And so, competing lovingly for both honor and profit, they set themselves to copy everything, from the large things down to the most minute, such as millet seed, hemp seed, bunches of fennel, and the like, in such a manner that those festoons proved to be very beautiful, and both of them received from Vasari the prize of the scarlet hose. Giorgio took great pains to persuade Cristofano to execute by himself part of the designs for the scenes that were to go into the frieze, but he would never do it. Wherefore, the while that Giorgio was drawing them himself, 
Girardi executed the buildings in two of the panel pictures with much grace and beauty of manner and such perfection that a master of great judgment, even if he had had the cartoons before him, could not have done what Cristofano did. And, in truth, there never was a painter who could do by himself and without study the things that he contrived to do. After having finished the execution of the buildings in the two panel pictures, the while that Vasari was carrying to completion the twenty stories from the Apocalypse for the above-mentioned frieze, Cristofano, taking in hand the panel picture in which St. Gregory, whose head is a portrait of Pope Clement the Seventh, is eating with his twelve poor men, executed the whole service of the table, all very lifelike and most natural. Then, a beginning having been made with the third panel picture, while Stefano was occupied with the gilding of the ornamental frames of the other two, a staging was erected upon two trestles of wood, from which, while Vasari was painting on one side, in a glory of sunlight, the three angels that appeared to Abraham in the valley of Mambre, Cristofano painted some buildings on the other side. But he was always making some contraption with stools and tables, and at times with basins and pans upside down, on which he would climb like the casual creature that he was. And once it happened that, seeking to draw back, in order to look at what he had done, one of his feet gave way under him, the whole contraption turned topsy-turvy, and he fell from a height of five brachia, bruising himself so grievously that he had to be bled and properly nursed, or he would have died. And what was worse, being the sort of careless fellow that he was, one night there slipped off the bandages that were on the arm from which the blood had been drawn to the great danger of his life, so that if Stefano, who was sleeping with him, had not noticed this, it would have been all up with him, and even so Stefano had something to do to revive him, for the bed was a lake of blood, and he himself was reduced almost to his last gasp. Vasari, therefore, taking him under his own particular charge, as if he had been his brother, had him tended with the greatest possible care, than which, indeed, nothing less would have sufficed. And with all this he was not restored until that work was completely finished. After that, returning to San Gustino, Cristofano completed some of the apartments of the abbot there, which had been left unfinished, and then executed at Citta de Castello, all with his own hand, an altarpiece that had been allotted to Battista, his dearest friend, and a lunette that is over the side door of San Fiorido, containing three figures in fresco. Giorgio being afterwards summoned to Venice at the instance of Messer Pietro Aretino, in order to arrange and execute for the nobles and gentlemen of the company of the Calza the setting for a most sumptuous and magnificent festival, and the scenery of a comedy written by that same Messer Pietro Aretino for those gentlemen, Giorgio, I say, knowing that he was not able to carry out so great a work by himself alone, sent for Cristofano and the above-mentioned Battista Cungi, and they, having finally arrived in Venice, after being carried by the chances of the sea to Sclavonia, found that Vasari not only had arrived there before them, but had already designed everything, so that there was nothing for them to do but to set hand to painting. Now the said gentleman of the Calza had taken at the end of the Canareo a large house which was not finished. It had nothing, indeed, save the main walls and the roof, and in a space forming an apartment, seventy brachia long and sixteen brachia wide, Giorgio caused to be made two ranges of wooden steps, four brachia in height from the floor, on which the ladies were to be seated. The walls at the sides he divided each into four square spaces of ten brachia, separated by niches each four brachia in breadth, within which 
were figures, and these niches had on either side a terminal figure in relief, nine brachia high, insomuch that the niches on either side were five, and the terminal figures ten. And in the whole apartment there were altogether ten niches, twenty terminal figures, and eight square pictures with scenes. In the first of these pictures, which were all in chiascuro, that on the right hand, next the stage, there was, representing Venice, a most beautiful figure of Adria, depicted as seated upon a rock, in the midst of the sea, with a branch of coral in the hand. Around her stood Neptune, Thetis, Proteus, Nereus, Glaucus, Palemon, and other sea gods and nymphs, who were presenting to her jewels, pearls, gold, and other riches of the sea. And besides this there were some loves that were shooting arrows, and others that were flying through the air and scattering flowers, and the rest of the field of the picture was all most beautiful palms. In the second picture were the rivers Drava and Sava naked, with their vases. In the third was the Po, conceived as large and corpulent, with seven suns, representing the seven branches which, issuing from the Po, pour into the sea as if each of them were a kingly river. In the fourth was the Brenta, with other rivers of Friuli. On the other wall, opposite to the Adria, was the island of Candia, wherein was to be found seen Jove being suckled by the goat, with many nymphs around. Besides this, and opposite to the Drava, were the river Tagliamento and the mountains of Cadori. Beyond this, opposite to the Po, were Lake Benicus and the Mincio, which were pouring their waters into the Po, and beside them, opposite to the Brenta, were the Adigi and the Tessino, falling into the sea. The pictures on the right-hand side were divided by these virtues, placed in the niches, liberality, concord, compassion, peace, and religion and opposite to these on the other wall were fortitude, civic wisdom, justice, a victory with war beneath her, and lastly a charity. Above all, then, were a large cornice and architrave, and a frieze full of lights and of glass globes filled with distilled waters, to the end that these, having lights behind them, might illuminate the whole apartment. Next, the ceiling was divided into four quadrangular compartments, each ten brachia wide in one direction, and eight brachia in the other. And with a width equal to that of the niches of four brachia, there was a frieze which ran right round the cornice, while in a line with the niches there came in the middle of all the spaces a compartment three brachia square. These compartments were in all twenty-three, without counting one of double size that was above the stage, which brought the number up to twenty-four, and in them were the hours twelve of the night, namely, and twelve of the day. In the first of the compartments, ten brachia in length, which were above the stage, was Time, who was arranging the hours in their places, accompanied by Elus, god of the winds, by Juno, and by Iris. In another compartment, at the door of entrance, was the car of Aurora, who, rising from the arms of Tithonus, was scattering roses, while the car itself was being drawn by some cocks. In the third was the chariot of the sun, and in the fourth was the chariot of night, drawn by owls, and night had the moon upon her head, some bats in front of her, and all around her darkness. Of these pictures, Cristofano executed the greater part, and he acquitted himself so well that everyone stood marveling at them, particularly in the chariot of night, wherein he did in the way of oil sketches that which was, in a manner of speaking, not possible. And in the picture of Adria, likewise, he painted those monsters of the sea with such beauty and variety that whoever looked at them was struck with astonishment that a craftsman of his rank should have shown such knowledge. 
In short, in all this work, he bore himself beyond all expectation, like an able and well-practiced painter, and particularly in the foliage and grotesques. After finishing the preparations for that festival, Vasari and Cristofano stayed some months in Venice, painting for the magnificent Messer Giovanni Cornaro the ceiling, or rather soffit, of an apartment, into which there went nine large pictures in oils. Vasari being then entreated by the Veronese architect Michel San Michel to stay in Venice, he might perhaps have consented to remain there for a year or two but Cristofano always dissuaded him from it, saying that it was not a good thing to stay in Venice, where no account was taken of design, nor did the painters in that city make any use of it, not to mention that those painters themselves were the reason that no attention was paid there to the labors of the arts, and he declared that it would be better to return to Rome, the true school of noble arts, where ability was recognized much more than in Venice. The dissuasions of Cristofano being thus added to the little desire that Vasari had to stay there, they went off together. But since Cristofano, being an exile from the state of Florence, was not able to follow Giorgio, he returned to San Gustino, where he did not remain long doing some work all the time for the above-mentioned abbot, before he went to Perugia, on the first occasion, when Pope Paul III went there, after the war waged with the people of that city. There, in the festive preparations that were made to receive His Holiness, he acquitted himself very well in several works, and particularly in the portal called After Frate Rinieri, where, at the wish of Monsignor della Barba, who was then governor there, Cristofano executed a large Jove in anger and another pacified, which are two most beautiful figures, and on the other side he painted an atlas with the world on his back between two women, one of whom had a sword and the other a pair of scales. These works, with many others that Cristofano executed for those festivities, were the reason that afterwards, when the citadel had been built in Perugia by order of the same pontiff, Messer Tiberio Crispo, who was governor and castellan at that time, when causing many of the rooms to be painted, desired that Cristofano, in addition to that which Latanzio, a painter of the march, had executed in them up to that time, should also work there. Whereupon Cristofano not only assisted the above-named Latanzio, but afterwards executed with his own hand the greater part of the best works that are painted in the apartments of that fortress, in which there also worked Raffaello del Colle and Adone Doni of Assisi, an able and well-practiced painter who has executed many things in his native city and in other places. Tomasco Papacello also worked there, but the best that there was among them, and the one who gained most praise there, was Cristofano, on which account he was recommended by Latanzio to the favor of the said Crispo, and was ever afterwards much employed by him. Meanwhile, that same Crispo, having built in Perugia a new little church known as Santa Maria del Popolo, but first called del Mercato, Latanzio had begun for it an altarpiece in oils, and in this Cristofano painted with his own hand all the upper part, which is indeed most beautiful and worthy of great praise. Then, Latanzio having been changed from a painter into the constable of Perugia, Cristofano returned to San Gustino, where he stayed many months, again working for the above-named Lord Abbot Buffolini. After this, in the year 1543, Giorgio Vasari, having to execute a panel picture in oils for the great Cancelleria by order of the most illustrious Cardinal Farnese, and another for the Church of Sant'Agostino at the commission of Galeotto da Gironi, sent for Cristofano, who went very willingly as one who had a desire to see Rome. 
There he stayed many months, doing little else but go about seeing everything. But nevertheless he thus gained so much that after returning once more to San Gustino, he painted in a hall some figures after his own fancy, which were so beautiful that it appeared that he must have studied at them twenty years. Then, in the year of 1545, Vasari had to go to Naples to paint for the monks of Monte Alavito, a refectory involving much more work than that of San Michel in Basco at Bologna, and he sent for Cristofano, Raffaello del Colli, and Stefano, already mentioned as his friends and pupils and they all came together at the appointed time in Naples, excepting Cristofano, who remained behind because he was ill. However, being pressed by Vasari, he made his way to Rome on his journey to Naples, but he was detained by his brother, Borgognoni, who was likewise an exile, and who wished to take him to France, to enter the service of the Colonel Giovanni da Torino, and so that occasion was lost. But when Vasari returned from Naples to Rome in the year 1546 in order to execute twenty-four pictures that were afterwards sent to Naples and placed in the sacristy of San Giovanni Carbonaro in which he painted stories from the Old Testament and also from the life of St. John the Baptist with figures of one braccia or a little more, and also in order to paint the doors of the organ of the Piscopio, which were six braccia in height, he availed himself of Cristofano, who was of great assistance to him, and executed figures and landscapes in those works excellently well. Giorgio had also proposed to make use of him in the hall of the Cancelleria, which was painted after cartoons by his hand, and entirely finished in a hundred days, for Cardinal Farnese. But in this he did not succeed, for Cristofano fell ill and returned to San Gustino as soon as he had begun to mend and Vasari finished the hall without him, assisted by Raffaello del Colli, the Bolognese Giovanni Battista Bagna Cavallo, the Spaniards Roviali and Bezera, and many others of his friends and pupils. After returning from Rome to Florence, and setting out from that city to go to Rimini, to paint a chapel in fresco, and an altarpiece in the church of the monks of Monte Alavito for Abbot Gian Matteo Fatani, Giorgio passed through San Gustino in order to take Cristofano with him, but Abbot Buffolini, for whom he was painting a hall, would not let him go for the time being, although he promised Giorgio that he should send Cristofano to him soon all the way to Romagna. But notwithstanding such a promise, the abbot delayed so long to send him that Cristofano, when he did go, found that Vasari had not only finished all the work for the other abbot, but had also executed an altarpiece for the high altar of San Francesco at Rimini, for Messer Niccolo Margeselli, and another altarpiece in the church of Classi, belonging to the monks of Camaldoli at Ravenna, for Don Romualdo da Verona, the abbot of that abbey. In the year 1550, not long before this, Giorgio had just executed the story of the marriage of Esther in the Black Friars Abbey of San Fiori, that is, in the refectory at Arezzo, and also at Florence for the chapel of the Martelli in the church of San Lorenzo, the altarpiece of San Gismondo, when, Julius the Third, having been elected Pope, he was summoned to Rome to enter the service of His Holiness. Thereupon he thought for certain that by means of Cardinal Farnese, who went at that time to stay in Florence, he would be able to reinstate Cristofano in his country and restore him to the favor of Duke Cosimo. But this proved to be impossible, so that poor Cristofano had to stay as he was until 1554, at which time Vasari, having been invited into the service of Duke Cosimo, there came to him an opportunity of delivering Cristofano. Bishop Daricasoli, who knew that he would be doing a thing pleasing to his excellency, 
had set to work to have the three facades of his palace, which stands on the abutment of the Ponte alla Caraja, painted in chiascuro, when Messer Sforza Almeni, cup-bearer as well as first and favoured chamberlain to the duke, resolved that he also would have his house in the Via di Servi, painted in chiascuro, in emulation of the bishop. But not having found in Florence any painters according to his fancy, he wrote to Giorgio Vasari, who had not then arrived in Florence, that he should think out the inventions and send him designs of all that it might seem to him best to paint on that façade of his. Whereupon Giorgio, who was much his friend, for they had known each other from the time when they were both in the service of Duke Alessandro, having thought out the whole according to the measurements of the façade sent him a design of most beautiful invention which embellished the windows and joined them together with a well-varied decoration in a straight line from top to bottom and filled all the spaces in the façade with rich scenes this design, I say, which contained, to put it briefly, the whole life of man, from birth to death, was sent by Vasari to Messer Sforza, and it so pleased him, and likewise the duke, that, in order that it might have all its perfection, they resolved that they would not have it taken in hand until such time as Vasari himself should have arrived in Florence which Vasari having at last come, and having been received by his most illustrious excellency, and by the above-named Messer Savorsa with great friendliness, they began to discuss who might be the right man to execute that façade. Whereupon Giorgio, not allowing the occasion to slip by, said to Messer Savorsa that no one was better able to carry out that work than Cristofano and that neither in that nor in the works that were to be executed in the palace could he do without cristofano's aid and so messer sforza having spoken of this to the duke after many inquiries it was found that cristofano's crime was not so black as it had been painted and the poor fellow was at last pardoned by his excellency which news, having been received by Vasari, who was at Arezzo, revisiting his native place and his friends, he sent a messenger expressly to Cristofano, who knew nothing of the matter, to give him that good news, and when he heard it, he was like to faint with joy. All rejoicing, therefore, and confessing that no one had ever been a better friend to him than Vasari, he went off next morning from Sita di Castello to the Borgo, where, after presenting his letters of deliverance to the commissioner, he made his way to his father's house, where his mother and also his brother, who had been recalled from exile long before, were struck with astonishment. Then, after passing two days there, he went off to Arezzo, where he was received by Giorgio with more rejoicing than if he had been his own brother, and recognized that he was so beloved by Vasari that he resolved that he would spend the rest of his life with him. They then went from Arezzo to Florence together, and Cristofano went to kiss the hands of the duke, who received him readily, and was struck with amazement for the reason that, whereas he had thought to see some great bravo, he saw the best little man in the world. Cristofano was likewise made much of by Messer Sforza, who conceived a very great affection for him and he then set his hand to the above-mentioned façade. In that work, Giorgio, because it was not yet possible to work in the palace, assisted him at his own request to execute some designs for the scenes in the façade, also designing at times during the progress of the work on the plaster some of the figures that are there. But although there are in it many things retouched by Vasari, nevertheless the whole façade, with the greater part of the figures and all the ornaments, festoons, and large ovals, is by the hand of Cristofano, who, in truth, as may be seen, was so able in handling colors in fresco that it may be said, and Vasari confesses it, that he knew more about it than Giorgio himself 
and if Cristofano, when he was a lad, had exercised himself continuously in the studies of art, for he never did a drawing save when he had afterwards to carry it into execution, and had pursued the practice of art with spirit, he would have had no equal, seeing that his facility, judgment, and memory enabled him to execute his works in such a way, without any further study, that he used to surpass many who in fact knew more than he. Nor could any one believe with what facility and resolution he executed his labors, for when he set himself to work, no matter how long a time it might take, he so delighted in it that he would never lift his eyes off his painting, wherefore his friends might well expect the greatest things from him. Besides this, he was so gracious in his conversation and his jesting as he worked, that Vasari would at times stay working in his company from morning till night without ever growing weary. Cristofano executed this façade in a few months, not to mention that he sometimes stayed away some weeks without working there, going to the Borgo to see and enjoy his home. Now I do not wish to grudge the labor of describing the distribution and the figures of this work, which, from its being in the open air, and much exposed to the vagaries of the weather, may not have a very long life. Scarcely indeed was it finished when it was much injured by a terrible rain and a very heavy hail storm, and in some places the wall was stripped of plaster. In this façade, then, there are three compartments. The first, to begin at the foot, is where the principal door and the two windows are. The second is from the sill of those windows to that of the second range of windows. And the third is from those last windows to the cornice of the roof. There are, besides this, six windows in each range, which give seven spaces, and the whole work was divided, according to this plan, in straight lines from the cornice of the roof down to the ground. Next to the cornice of the roof, then, there is in perspective a great cornice with brackets that project over a frieze of little boys, six of whom stand upright along the breadth of the façade, namely, one above the center of the arch of each window and these support with their shoulders most beautiful festoons of fruits, leaves, and flowers, which run from one to another. These fruits and flowers are arranged in due succession according to the seasons, symbolizing the periods of our life, which is there depicted, and on the middle of the festoons, likewise, where they hang down, are other little boys in various attitudes. This frieze finished between the upper windows, in the spaces that are there, there were painted the seven planets with the seven celestial signs above them as a crown and an ornament. Beneath the sill of these windows, on the parapet, is a frieze of virtues, who, two by two, are holding seven great ovals, in which ovals are seven distinct stories representing the seven ages of man and each age is accompanied by two virtues appropriate to her. And beneath the ovals in the spaces between the lower windows there are the three theological and the four moral virtues. Below this, in the frieze that is above the door and the windows supported by knee-shaped brackets, are the seven liberal arts, each of which is in a line with the oval, in which is the particular story of the life of man appropriate to it. And in the same straight lines continued upwards are the moral virtues, planets, signs, and other corresponding symbols. Next, between the windows with knee-shaped brackets, there is life, both the active and the contemplative, with scenes and statues continued down to death, hell, and our final resurrection. In brief, Cristofano executed almost all by himself the whole cornice, the festoons, the little boys, and the seven signs of the planets. 
Then, beginning on one side, he painted first the moon, and represented her by a Diana, who has her lap full of flowers, after the manner of Proserpine, with a moon upon her head, and the sign of cancer above her. Below, in the oval wherein is the story of infancy, there are present at the birth of man some nurses who are suckling infants, and newly delivered women in bed, executed by Cristofano with much grace. And this oval is supported by Will alone, who is a half-nude young woman, fair and beautiful, and she is sustained by Charity, who is also suckling infants and beneath the oval on the parapet is Grammar, who is teaching some little boys to read. Beginning over again, there follows Mercury, with the caduceus and with his sign, who has below him in the oval some little boys, some of whom are going to school, and some playing. This oval is supported by Truth, who is a nude little girl, all pure and simple, who has on one side a male figure representing falsehood, with a variety of girt-up garments and a most beautiful countenance, but with the eyes much sunken. Beneath the oval of the windows is Faith, who, with the right hand, is baptizing a child in a conch full of water, and with the left hand is holding a cross, and below her on the parapet is logic covered by a veil with a serpent. Next follows the sun, represented by an Apollo, who has the lyre in his hand, with his sign in the ornament above. In the oval is adolescence, represented by two boys of equal age, one of whom, holding a branch of olive, is ascending a mountain illumined by the sun, and the other halting halfway up to admire the beauties that fraud displays from the middle upwards, without perceiving that her hideous countenance is concealed behind a smooth and beautiful mask, is caused by her and her wiles to fall over a precipice. This oval is supported by Sloth, a gross and corpulent man, who stands all sleepy and nude in the guise of a sullenness, and also by Toil, in the person of a robust and hard-working peasant, who has around him the implements for tilling the earth. These are supported by that part of the ornament that is between the windows where Hope is, who has the anchors at her feet, and on the parapet below is music, with various musical instruments about her. There follows in due order Venus, who has clasped love to her bosom and is kissing him, and she also has her sign above her. In the oval that she has beneath her is the story of youth, that is, in the center a young man seated with books, instruments for measuring, and other things appertaining to design, and in addition maps of the world and cosmographical globes and spheres. And behind him is a loggia, in which are young men who are merrily passing the time away with singing, dancing, and playing, and also a banquet of young people all given over to enjoyment. On one side this oval is supported by self-knowledge, who has about her compasses, armillary spheres, quadrants, and books, and is gazing at herself in a mirror and on the other side, by fraud, a hideous old hag, lean and toothless, who is mocking at self-knowledge, and in the act of covering her face with a smooth and beautiful mask. Below the oval is temperance, with a horse's bridle in her hand, and beneath her, on the parapet, is rhetoric, who is in a line with the other similar figures. Next to these comes Mars in armor, with many trophies about him, and with the sign of the lion above him. In his oval, which is below him, is virility, represented by a full-grown man, standing between memory and will, who are holding before him a basin of gold, containing a pair of wings, and are pointing out to him the path of deliverance in the direction of a mountain, And this oval is supported by Innocence, who is a maiden with a lamb at her side, 
and by hilarity, who, all smiling and merry, reveals herself at what she really is. Beneath the oval, between the windows, is Prudence, who is making herself beautiful before a mirror, and she has below her, on the parapet, a figure of philosophy. Next there follows Jove, with his thunderbolt and his bird, the eagle, and with his sign above him. In the oval is Old Age, who is represented by an old man clothed as a priest and kneeling before an altar, upon which he is placing the basin of gold with the two wings. And this oval is supported by Compassion, who is covering some naked little boys, and by Religion, enveloped in sacerdotal vestments. Below these is a fortitude in armor, who, planting one of her legs in a spirited attitude on a fragment of a column, is placing some balls in the mouth of a lion, and beneath her on the parapet she has a figure of astrology. The last of the seven planets is Saturn, depicted as an old man heavy with melancholy, who is devouring his own children with a great serpent that is seizing its own tail with its teeth, which Saturn has above him the sign of Capricorn. In the oval is decrepitude, and here is depicted Jove in heaven, receiving a naked and decrepit old man, kneeling who is watched over by felicity and immortality, who are casting his garments into the world. This oval is supported by Beatitude, who is upheld by a figure of justice in the ornament below, who is seated and has in her hand the scepter, and upon her shoulders the stork, with arms and laws around her, and on the parapet below is geometry. In the lowest part at the foot, which is about the windows with knee-shaped brackets and the door, is Leah in a niche, representing the act of life. And on the other side of the same place is Industry, who has a cornucopia and two goads in her hands. Near the door is a scene in which many masters in wood and stone, architects and stone cutters, have before them the gate of Cosmopolis a city built by the Lord Duke Cosimo in the island of Elba, with a representation of Porto Ferrajo. Between this scene and the frieze in which are the liberal arts is Lake Tresemine, round which are nymphs who are issuing from the water with tench, pike, eels, and roach. And beside the lake is Perugia, a nude figure holding with her hands a dog, which she is showing to a figure of Florence corresponding to her, who stands on the other side with a figure of Arno beside her, who is embracing and fondling her. And below this is the contemplative life in another scene, in which many philosophers and astrologers are measuring the heavens, appearing to be casting the horoscope of the duke. And beside this, in the niche corresponding to that of Leah is her sister Rachel, the daughter of Laban, representing the contemplative life. The last scene, which is likewise between two niches and forms the conclusion of the whole invention, is Death, who, mounted on a lean horse and holding the scythe, and accompanied by war, pestilence, and famine, is riding over persons of every kind. In one niche is the god Pluto, and beneath him Cerberus, the hound of hell. And in the other is a large figure rising again from a sepulchre on the last day. After all these things, Cristofano executed on the pediments of the windows with knee-shaped brackets some nude figures that are holding the devices of his excellency and over the door a duckle coat of arms, the six balls of which are upheld by some naked little boys, who twine in and out between each other as they fly through the air. And last of all, in the bases at the foot, beneath all the scenes, the same Cristofano painted the device of Messer Sforza, that is, some obelisks, or rather triangular pyramids, which rest upon three balls, with a motto around that reads, Immobilis. 
This work, when finished, was vastly extolled by His Excellency and by Messer Svorza himself, who, like the courteous gentleman that he was, wished to reward with a considerable present the art and industry of Cristofano. But he would have none of it, being contented and fully repaid by the good will of that Lord, who loved him ever afterwards more than I could say. While the work was being executed, Vasari had Cristofano with him, as he had always done in the past, in the house of Signor Bernadetto de Medici, who much delighted in painting, which, having perceived, Cristofano painted two scenes in Chioscuro in a corner of his garden. One was the rape of Proserpine, and in the other were Vertumnus and Pomona, the deities of agriculture. And besides this, Cristofano painted in this work some ornaments of terminal figures and children of such variety and beauty that there is nothing better to be seen. Meanwhile, arrangements had been made for beginning to paint in the palace, and the first thing that was taken in hand was a hall in the new apartments, which, being twenty braccia wide, and having a height, according as Tasso had constructed it, of not more than nine braccia, was raised three braccia with beautiful ingenuity by Vasari, that is, to a total height of twelve braccia, without moving the roof, which was half a pavilion roof. But because in doing this, before it could become possible to paint, much time had to be devoted to reconstructing the ceilings and to other works in that apartment and in others, Vasari himself obtained leave to go to Arezzo to spend two months there together with Cristofano. However, he did not succeed in being able to rest during that time for the reason that he could not refuse to go in those days to Cortona, where he painted in fresco the vaulting and the walls of the Company of Jesus with the assistance of Cristofano, who acquitted himself very well, and particularly in the twelve different sacrifices from the Old Testament, which they executed in the lunettes between the spandrels of the vaulting. Indeed, to speak more exactly, almost the whole of this work was by the hand of Cristofano, Vasari having done nothing therein beyond making certain sketches, designing some parts on the plaster, and then retouching it at times in various places, according as it was necessary. This work finished, which is not otherwise than grand, worthy of praise, and very well executed, by reason of the great variety of things that are in it, they both returned to Florence in the month of January of the year 1555. There, having taken in hand the Hall of the Elements, while Vasari was painting the pictures of the ceiling, Cristofano executed some devices that bind together the friezes of the beams in perpendicular lines, in which are heads of Capricorns and tortoises with the sail, devices of His Excellency. But the works in which he showed himself most marvellous were some festoons of fruits that are in the friezes of the beams on the underside, which are so beautiful that there is nothing better coloured or more natural to be seen, particularly because they are separated one from another by certain masks that hold in their mouths the ligatures of the festoons, than which one would not be able to find any more varied or more bizarre in which manner of work it may be said that Cristofano was superior to any other who has ever made it his principal and particular profession. This done, he painted some large figures on that part of the walls where there is the birth of Venus, but after the cartoons of Vasari, and many little figures in a landscape which were executed very well in like manner on the wall where there are the loves as tiny little children fashioning the arrows of cupid he painted the three cyclops forging thunderbolts for jove 
over six doors he executed in fresco six large ovals with ornaments in chioscuro and containing scenes in the color of bronze which were very beautiful and in the same hall between the windows he painted in colors a mercury and a pluto which are likewise very beautiful work being then begun in the chamber of the goddess ops which is next to that described above he painted the four seasons in fresco on the ceiling and in addition to the figures some festoons that were marvellous in their variety and beauty for the reason that even as those of spring were filled with a thousand kinds of flowers so those of summer were painted with an infinite number of fruits and cereals those of autumn were of leaves and bunches of the grape, and those of winter were of onions, turnips, radishes, carrots, parsnips, and dried leaves, not to mention that in the central picture, in which is the car of ops, he colored so beautifully in oils four lions that are drawing the car that nothing better could be done, and in truth in painting animals he had no equal. Then, in the chamber of Ceres, which is beside the last named, he executed in certain angles some little boys and festoons that are beautiful to a marvel. And in the central picture, where Vasari had painted Ceres seeking for Proserpine with a lighted pine torch, upon a car drawn by two serpents, Cristofano carried many things to completion with his own hand, because Vasari was ill at that time, and had left that picture, among other things, unfinished. Finally, when it came to decorating a terrace that is beyond the chamber of Jove and beside that of Ops, it was decided that all the history of Juno should be painted there. And so, after all the ornamentation in stucco had been finished, with very rich carvings and various compositions of figures wrought after the cartoons of Vasari, the same Vasari ordained that Cristofano should execute that work by himself in fresco, desiring, since it was a work to be seen from near, and of figures not higher than one braccio, that Gerardo should do something beautiful in this, which was his peculiar profession. Cristofano then executed in an oval on the vaulting a marriage with Juno in the sky, and in a picture on one side, Hebe, goddess of youth, and on the other, Iris, who is pointing to the rainbow in the heavens. On the same vaulting, he painted three other quadrangular pictures, two to match the others, and a larger one in a line with the oval in which is the marriage, and in the last named picture is Juno, seated in a car drawn by peacocks. In one of the other two, which are on either side of that one, is the goddess of power, and in the other, abundance with the cornucopia at her feet and in two other pictures on the walls below, over the openings of two doors, are two other stories of Juno, the transformation of Io, the daughter of the river Iancus, into a cow, and of Callisto into a bear. During the execution of that work, His Excellency conceived a very great affection for Cristofano, seeing him zealous and diligent in no ordinary manner at his work for the morning had scarcely broken into day when cristofano would appear at his labor of which he had such a love and it so delighted him that very often he would not finish dressing before setting out and at times nay frequently it happened that in his haste he put on a pair of shoes all such things he kept under his bed that were not fellows but of two kinds and more often than not he had his cloak wrong side out with the hood on the inside one morning therefore appearing at an early hour at his work where the lord duke and the lady duchess were standing looking at it while preparations were being made to set out for the chase and the ladies and others of the court were making themselves ready they noticed that Cristofano had, as usual, his cloak wrong side out, and the hood inside. At which, both laughing, the duke said, 
What is your idea in always wearing your cloak inside out? I know not, my lord, answered Cristofano, but I mean to find some day a kind of cloak that shall have neither right side nor wrong side, and shall be the same on both sides, for I have not the patience to think of wearing it in any other way. Since in the morning I generally dress and go out of the house in the dark, besides that I have one eye so feeble that I can see nothing with it. But let your excellency look at what I paint, and not at my manner of dressing. The duke said nothing in answer, but within a few days he caused to be made for him a cloak of the finest cloth, with the pieces sewn and drawn together in such a manner that there was no difference to be seen between outside and inside, and the collar worked with braid in the same manner both inside and out and so also the trimming that it had round the edges. This being finished, he sent it to Cristofano by a lackey, commanding the man that he should give it to him on the part of the duke. Having therefore received the cloak very early one morning, Cristofano, without making any further ceremony, tried it on, and then said to the lackey, The duke is a man of sense. Tell him that it suits me well. Now, since Cristofano was thus careless of his person, and hated nothing more than to have to put on new clothes, or to go about too tightly constrained and confined in them, Vasari, who knew this humor of his, whenever he observed that he was in need of any new clothes, used to have them made for him in secret, and then, early one morning, used to place these in his chamber and take away the old ones and so cristofano was forced to put on those that he found but it was marvellous sport to stand and hear him raging with fury as he dressed himself in the new clothes look here he would say what devilments are these devil take it can a man not live in his own way in this world without the enemies of comfort giving themselves all this trouble One morning, among others, Cristofano having put on a pair of white hose, the painter Domenico Benci, who was also working in the palace with Vasari, contrived to persuade him to go with himself, in company with other young men, to the Madonna dell'Imprunetta. There they walked, danced, and enjoyed themselves all day, and in the evening, after supper, they returned home. Then Cristofano, who was tired, went off straightway to his room to sleep, but when he set himself to take off his hose, what with their being new and his having sweated, he was not able to pull off more than one of them. Now Vasari, having gone in the evening to see how he was, found that he had fallen asleep with one leg covered and the other bare whereupon one servant holding his leg and the other pulling at the stocking they contrived to draw it off while he lay cursing clothes giorgio and him who invented such fashions as so he said kept men bound in chains like slaves nay he grumbled that he would take leave of them all and by hook or by crook return to san gustino where he was allowed to live in his own way and had not all these restraints and it was the devil's own business to pacify him it pleased him to talk seldom and he loved that others also should be brief in speaking insomuch that he would have gone so far as to have men's proper names very short, like that of a slave belonging to Messer Sforza, who was called M. These, said Cristofano, are fine names, and not your Giovanni Francesco and Giovanni Antonio, which take an hour's work to pronounce and since he was a good fellow at heart, and said these things in his own jargon of the Borgo, it would have made the doleful knight himself laugh. He delighted to go on feast days to the places where legends and printed pictures were sold, and he would not stay there the whole day. And if he bought some, more often than not, while he went about looking at the others, he would leave them at some place where he had been leaning and never, unless he was forced, would he go on horseback, although he was born from a noble family in his native place and was rich enough. Finally, 
His brother Borgognone having died, he had to go to the Borgo, and Vasari, who had drawn much of the money of his salary and had kept it for him, said to him, See, I have all this money of yours. It is right that you should take it with you and make use of it in your requirements. I want no money, answered Cristofano. Take it for yourself. For me, it is enough to have the luck to stay with you and to live and die in your company. It is not my custom, replied Vasari, to profit by the labor of others. If you will not have it, I shall send it to your father, Guido. That you must not do, said Cristofano, for he would only waste it as he always does. In the end he took the money and went off to the Borgo, but in poor health and with little contentment of mind. And after arriving there, what with his sorrow at the death of his brother, whom he had loved very dearly, and a cruel flux of the reins, he died in a few days after receiving the full sacraments of the church and distributing to his family and to many poor persons the money that he had brought. He declared a little before his death that it grieved him for no other reason save that he was leaving Vasari too much embarrassed by the great labors to which he had set his hand in the palace of the duke. Not long afterwards, his excellency, having heard of the death of Cristofano, and that with true regret, he caused a head of him to be made in marble, and sent it with the underwritten epitaph from Florence to the Borgo, where it was placed in San Francesco. Deo optimo maximo, Cristoforo Gerardo Burgensi, Pingendi arte prestantes, Quad Dorgius Vasarius Arantinus, Hujus, artis facile princeps, in exornando cosmi florentin, ducis paletio, ilias operam quam maxime, probaverit, pictoris hetrosci possuer, obit anno domini, 1556, vixit an 56, m 3, d 6.